It's October 10th, 2004, 4 o'clock p.m., and you're watching Dog Shirt TV. It's a special dog shirt today. It is one sent to me by a viewer in uh, earlier in the days of uh, Dog Shirt Daily. Uh, it's a dog with headphones. It's a podcasting dog. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those days. It is uh, Erev Rosh Hashanah. The sun is slowly starting to decline, uh, which means that uh, Alan Rosenstein uh, will be repenting his many sins as we enter the days of awe. We're going to talk about the many sins he has to uh, rid himself of. Uh, look. Uh, we're not allowed to have fun anymore, but we are allowed to mispronounce willfully and intentionally and always the name of Alan Rosenstein, the first ever Lawfare student contributor, now a professor at the University of Minnesota, where he occupies the Governor Wall's chair of passive aggressive um debate oh my god i would i would totally that would be awesome we need all to right so that. here is where we're gonna start alan you promised not to watch the debate did you uh honor your promise i refuse on principle to watch any i i say this as someone who's quite politically engaged i will not watch presidential debates vice presidential debates i will not do it ever all right so uh first of all why not so I think uh, part of it is because I'm sleepy and I would always much rather go to, I have two small children. I'd much rather go to bed. Part of it is because I give presidential debates. They like, they make me too nervous. Like I just, I, I'm not, I was one of those people who like, like couldn't watch like Curb Your Enthusiasm or, or Arrested Development because the awkwardness just like makes me too weirded out. And I just, I'm just, I'm too scared. I don't watch horror movies or anything like that. And I just, I can't, I cannot watch, I cannot watch the debates. Um, the third reason is because I actually think not watching the debate is better in trying to understand the role of the debate in the election. Cause of course, like my pointy headed, my like pointy headed Minnesota intellectual view of the debate is utterly irrelevant. And so it's actually, I think much more useful just to sort of go straight to the commentary and then like what the focus groups thought. And then if there's like really important stuff, I'll just watch the little clips of it. So. All right, so let's do. We're gonna we're gonna do this. Uh, Alan, having not watched the debate, uh, what do you think of the debate, Alan? Who won? <laughs> Whose campaign did it help or hurt? Go. Yeah, I, I mean that's the big thing, right? Is that like it's a vice presidential debate? So like I don't know the eleven people who watched it. Uh, I'm not sure it probably changed many people's opinions. I, I've I've heard that the focus groups sort of gave it to Waltz, um, though the the pointy headed intellectuals. I think that Waltz did not do a very good job, which which sounds plausible. I mean, this is where the they should have, you know, she should have picked Shapiro, I guess, uh, argument comes in. Though, of course, see, this is the reason I don't watch debates, because, like, I'm the sort of pointy-headed intellectual and, like, former very mediocre high school debater that really cares about, you know, art, like, like uh, the ability to be super eloquent and articulate on the fly. And, of course, like, that's not what normal people care about, because, of, like, they shouldn't. It doesn't really matter. So, um you know, my sense among the sort of the, the, the literati is that J.D. Vance, like, may have sort of won the debate on eloquence or like Tim Waltz didn't do very well, but it doesn't really matter. But of course, at the end of the day, um, the, the clip that will be played a million times over is Waltz asking Vance if Trump lost the 2020 election. And, and the not. abortion stuff. And the abortion stuff. And the abortion stuff. Right. So there wow. you have it, Alan. Without having watched the debate, you have given precisely the same commentary <laughs> as all the the people who have watched. And, the and I got three extra hours of sleep. Right. So, and, no. No. Well done. I I'm think, saying. I think if the if the question is who won, you I, were, I won. I won. Yeah, you debate. won. I um, won the debate. I was asleep at the time. All right. So. Uh, uh, I have a couple questions about this. Okay. When, and this is in your capacity as the Tim Walls chair of passive aggressive uh, uh, debate style in, at the University of Minnesota. When a Minnesotan says, I agree with a lot of what you just said, but yeah. does that mean A, 
I agree with a lot of what you said, but B, I agree with none of what you just said, you fucking loser. Yeah, yeah. it means I'm, it means you're a flaming asshole and going straight to hell. Okay, so when when because Tim Walls began every third sentence with that, and I just want you to translate that into into normal. Well, let's just let honest Jew speak, right? How, yeah, how yeah. Long, like, Long Island like, Jew, which is what no, I actually am. No Jew talks that way. Um, when when Tim Walls says that, how do we translate it? Go to hell, you flaming moron! I mean, I really, I really, I mean, I really do think that Tim Walls's contempt for JD Vance knows few bounds. I also think he takes it personally because he, you know, of course they are they are fellow Midwesterners. So I think there's a, a little bit of that. Uh, you're better than this. Oh, You're from J- Ohio. You yeah, know? but J.D. Vance isn't really a Midwesterner. He's an Appalachian, right? That's not the Midwest. That's sort of mountain I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the fault lines. Okay, but all right. Like, just help me, like, unpack the Midwest here. I, how do you know when the governor of Minnesota says what amounts to bless your heart? Uh, I, I, only it's formulated as a substantive agreement. How do you know when he agrees? You, you never know. That's the whole point. If you knew, it wouldn't work. It, it is entirely the, 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 the Midwest speaks entirely in strategic ambiguity. That's the beauty of it. You never know. You never know if anyone likes you or dislikes you. Like this is uh, it's, 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 it's the dark side of the upper Midwest. And is it, no only the, is it only the upper Midwest? Um, I think it's especially the upper Midwest. Um, because, you know, as you go, as you go more and more North, you get into that sort of like Lutheran stoicism thing where you, you're really buttoned down. Um, you know, so, so I think Minnesota is like the absolute apotheosis of this because as you go South into the Midwest, right. As you get into like I don't Southern find, Indiana, like I mean, you're getting more like into that. the South. Pardon? I don't find Denmark like that or Sweden particularly. Well, that's what they want you to think. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly the point they're running circles around you that they have you exactly where they want you my friend i don't you know all right i'm a simple person when somebody says they agree with me but i just reflexively assume that if they disagreed with me they'd say you're full of shit with us no they just won't invite you to the next potluck all right um this is this is making me upset just thinking about it. <laughs> All right. Um, next question about the debate you didn't watch. Um, if J.D. Vance um, wins the whole debate, except then it turns all of a sudden about health care and then he can't answer a question about January 6th. So he wins the first 45 minutes decisively as the New York Times, the Daily says, and then it kind of blows up in his face. Did he win or lose? Yeah, I mean, we won't know. I mean, look, none of this matters is like the main answer. Um, But of course, we won't know for probably a week or two. I mean, you have to see how the media cycle plays out. I mean, it just, it, it depends entirely on what the, what the coverage is, right? Because you can imagine it going in, you, know, you, you can imagine the New York Times being like, oh, Democrats are rethinking whether Waltz was a good choice and maybe Shapiro would have, you know, do you imagine that? You can imagine that line of stories. Or you can imagine the, um, you know, um, uh, 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 you know v- v- Vance refuses to say whether his boss who, by the way, tried to have his predecessor killed, um, won the 2020 debate. Um, so that's kind of one set of questions. And, and then, you know, among, among that, among that um, combination, right, or among those alternatives, what, can, one that, what then gets filtered into the, the relevant media of the seven undecided voters in America? Um, so um, we won't know. But, you know, it has been, a, it has been a, a extremely, it has been a fairly uneventful two weeks. So it assuming really that it continues to be pretty, I mean, in American domestic politics, not like in the world, of course. Yeah, yeah we knew what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but here's my question. Yeah. And this has been bugging me. We all talk as though we are supposed to have respect for undivide, undecided voters. Do you have respect for undecided voters? Look, I, I, I think we should have respect for, for all people. 
And, you know, and even if we don't, showing disrespect to undecided voters is probably not the best strategy to get their votes. But I get your point. It, it is a little hard in the year of our Lord 2024 to like, how, it, it, how can you be un, like, what are you undecided about? Is right. It, is like a fair. What, what's the added piece of information that you're waiting for? Yeah. Um, you know, when people say, I, I, you know, I mean, I do feel like Scott Shapiro's old uh, joke about, you know, the undecided voter, you know, on the one, this makes me less likely to vote for Trump. This makes me like is is increasingly just like describing a reality. If you're if you're what what is the piece of information that you're waiting for at this point as an undecided voter? I, I don't know. And, and I don't think it's about information, frankly. I, I, I wonder if it'd be, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting to sort of do like a sociological study of undecided voters and who their social networks are. I, I don't mean social networks in like the like online sense. I mean, like their actual friends and family, because you can imagine you can imagine not being undecided because you're like, huh, Harris or Trump, I wonder, right? Um, but because, you know, like half of your friends are Trump people and half of your friends are Harris people, right? And and it's and politics is so unpleasantly tribal and partisan these days. I think in part because the stakes are quite high. I, I'm actually not one of those people that necessarily bemoans, you know, the stakes of politics. I think the stakes are very high, but it is nevertheless quite unpleasant. And I can imagine being sort of, I'm not myself super politically engaged, right? Like, I'm not that interested in this, let's say. It doesn't seem to directly affect my life. And I have like half of my people are like very much on one side and half of people very much on the other side. So I am like undecided because my vibes are undecided. And as much as we like to pretend that politics is this intellectual, well, I've analyzed the policy platforms of the candidates and stuff like that. Um, it's very vibes based, and and it's not just vibes based for the quote unquote low information voter. It's it's there's actually interesting a lot of politics, a lot of good you know political science about how it's vibes. It's actually somehow even more vibes based the more you know about politics. So I can I can imagine being undecided in in that sense. All um, right, I wanna I wanna put forward a bold and rash proposition to which I am not committed, and I want to invite the audience uh, who may have thoughts on it to uh, join. Uh, Alan Rosenstein in responding. Um, that when is start, when you when you choke on your own mispronunciation of my <laughs> name, you will only have yourself to blame for. Yeah, well, Wheaties. All right. Um, here it is. There is actually no such thing as an undecided voter in the sense of somebody who is genuinely unsure whether they are going to vote for Donald Trump or Kamala Harris. There are people who are undecided whether they're going to vote at all. There are people who are who may be undecided whether they're going to vote for Donald Trump or leave that part of the ballot blank or, you know, people who are undecided about Kamala Harris versus Cornell West or Jill Stein. Right. But there is actually nobody out there today who is. You know, on the one hand, Donald Trump is a businessman. That's the positives. On the other hand, he tried to overthrow the constitutional order. But on the other hand, he moved the embassy to Jerusalem and Kamala Harris. You know, there's some inflation. Right? I don't think anybody is actually making those calculations. That's my humble thesis. The undecided voter between Trump and Harris actually doesn't exist. Yeah, I think that's I think that's plausible. I mean, to the extent that the argument is like, if you've thought about this enough to try to articulate the policy position, you have definitely made a decision. Um, I think that's probably true. But I still I still think that there is an undecided voter in the sense of like, like, you know, every, you know, all my friends are like, they're endlessly talking about this. And like, should I vote? And if I vote, who am I going to vote for? I, I do think you can be undecided there. But yes, once you've gotten to the point of, you know, um, thinking about their health policy plans, you know, you've obviously decided because you've I been just, thinking about this for more than 30 seconds. Yeah. I just think when somebody says they're undecided, they almost never mean that they are actually going to go vote, that they will vote for either the Republican Donald Trump or the Democrat Kamala Harris. 
and they don't know which one they're going to vote for yet. Well, so then, so then like when, when after the debate, there's this eight person town hall of quote unquote undecided voters, are those people lying? Are they deluding themselves? Like who are those people in your view? I think they're people who in some, so first of all, they're people who say they're undecided voters. And sometimes the the act of saying undece- you're an undecided voter is a cognitive decision to be one. Let me give you a real life example of this. Brett Stevens, who claims to be an undecided voter, who doesn't, he won't vote for Trump, but he's not yet sold on Kamala Harris. I'm, I'm here to tell you, he's going to vote for Kamala Harris. And um, he's now he may not have allowed himself to know that yet, but he's going to. And um, by the way, if he doesn't, it will be for purposes of being an undecided voter for his column. Right. And I think there are a bunch of people who like being an undecided voter. And so they say they're undecided, but in their hearts of hearts, they they know what they're going to do, or at least they know what they're not going to do, which in practice turns into the same thing. And so my theory is that when the polls move, the polls are moving because the likely voter is changing. And the, you know, the different voting bases are are animated to different degrees at different times. And that's why in an era like this, which is an era of nearly zero persuasion, um, not not zero because, you know, Kamala Harris does better than Joe Biden and I think actually moved some people, but you have near zero persuasion. It becomes much more an issue of animating and changing what the voting electorate actually looks like. Yeah. I mean, that's plausible though, though. I guess, I guess my question then is how that would how that would reflect in the poll numbers, right? So like I'm, I, I don't know that much about polling methodology, but like they do, they call a bunch of people and say, who are you voting for? Is it Trump or Biden or something like that. W- when that shifts, that's because like someone who said I'm undecided said, okay, I'm not voting for. Not necessarily. It could be because more of the Trump voters said uh, if, if Trump's numbers went down among likely voters, uh, I'll probably vote rather than I'll definitely vote, right? It could be because of a shift in how the weighting happens. Yeah. So I, so I, I mean, that, that's an interesting question about how the different polls do their weighting, right? Um, uh, you, know, you don't know about that. No, I mean, I look, I, I think, look, it's 2024. I mean, these, these candidates, at least Trump is just unbelievably well known. You're either voting for Trump or you're voting against Trump. Um, I don't want to say no one's voting for Harris. And I think she's actually been surprisingly, she's been more effective and, and I think charismatic than a lot of people give her credit for. But at the end of the day, like this is yet another referendum on Donald Trump. I mean, you know, I think it, when it was Biden, it was a referendum on both of them, but it's not a referendum on Harris, I don't think at all. Right. right. Um, which is, which is I, I suspect exactly, exactly what, where she wants it. <laughs> all right. So let's talk about the dock workers <sighs> strike because you, Alan, Rosenstein is obsessed with the dock workers. I'm a, strike. Little, I'm a little obsessed. Yeah, so I don't know anything about this except that they went on strike and it's going to fuck up the supply chain. So what do I need to know? So, so we have docks and we have longshoremen, and these are the people that move stuff from the boats to the to the. You can, can't can't you see how expert I am on? Uh, yeah, this is this is. Uh, so I've gotten very interested in this issue over the last twelve hours. So uh, I don't well, know. That's, that you know, that's the level of expertise we're we looking for on, here on, 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 on Dog Shirt TV. Yeah. Um, so you know, they're longshoremen, right? They move the stuff from the the ships to the to the ports. Um, there are like fifty thousand of them. They're unionized. Um, I think they get paid a pretty decent wage, fifty bucks an hour. Um, but you know, I don't I don't bemoan them trying to get sort of more money and more benefits for themselves. Um, but in the process, they are striking, potentially throwing the economy into an absolute tailspin. They're having pretty aggressive demands, like, uh, you know, $5 an hour raises every year for five years, which is a huge um, salary increase. And most damningly, they are trying to ensure that there's no automation in the, like, 
dock uh, operations, which is just utterly insane when you think about like, I get that these people want to preserve their jobs. We're talking about 50,000 jobs but wait versus what like- is, What does no automation mean? No forklifts? No, no, no. You no, got to no. do so, it all by hand? No, like, no, 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 no. They don't want to- Just no, no robots. No, I think they want to limit the amount of automated software, right? So like, like, you know, no one does anything by hand by hand, right? It's all those big cranes that go across the ship and they think the thing and stuff like that, right? Um, but um, American uh, shipping ports are some of the least um, efficient in the world. Um, especially relative to, you know, a lot of shipping ports in Europe and the Middle East and East Asia. And that's because those other ports have invested a huge amount into technology and automation. Um, and um, that, of course, on the margins can replace some jobs, not a ton of jobs, but presumably some. Though, again, it's actually not clear whether it would actually ultimately replace jobs on net, because, of course, our systems are so unbelievably inefficient that if they were more efficient, we would just get more shipping. And so you kind of have to balance that out. But just the idea um, that they would drive the economy to a halt because they who are already doing quite well want to like don't want to make our like horribly inefficient shipyards more efficient. It's just like it's the it's just the most grotesque sort of red seeking. Like this is why people hate you. It's like this is like you could not imagine a more cartoonish sort of short-term Pyrrhic victory for a union than this, because like, why it, do we assume it's short term? Um, there, it's not actually like there's another way. It's not like, you know, an automobile plant where you could, you give the union a favorable contract and then shut down the plant and, you know, move it to Mexico. Uh, you actually can't offshore these jobs um, by the nature of the way shipping works. Um, so why isn't this a situation in which they can actually retard progress um, and retard the development of more efficiency by taking more of the of the take? And it's a it's actually a medium and long term problem. Oh no 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 yeah when I, when I say short term I don't mean a day a month two months I mean a few years right so 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 first um, yeah you're you're right I mean the reason they have so much leverage is because there's no alternative you can't offshore longshoreman jobs, right? Um, they are literally on the shore. Um, uh, they have to be there. Um, you know, there is a law, I think it's called the Taft-Hartley. There's some law that um, gives the president the ability to force longshoremen to go back to work for 60 or 90 days. Um, Biden, through, I think, a combination of ideological conviction, uh, he's like a pro-union Pennsylvania, like Delaware guy, and also worry about the, you know, Democratic union base, especially given that this election will be decided in Pennsylvania, um, has said that he's not going to use that law. Um, I wonder if that's going to, I wonder how tenable that is if the country really goes into a tailspin because of this. At some point, you know, the economic calamity is going to be worse than a couple of lost votes in Pennsylvania, even if you're just thinking on a purely political calculation. Um, but but my my point my point is is a different one in that like the the cartoonishness of the um of the uh uh extortion that is happening right now and it is really not helped by just the unbelievable grossness of the union boss i forget his name but he's just like yeah he has like a $900,000 salary has been indicted twice for racketeering talks like an absolute gangster i mean it's just and is a friend of Trump's, right? A huge friend of Trump's, which totally scrambles the politics of all of this as well. I, I just think that, um, you know, the idea that Republicans are friends of unions is a joke. Because at the end of the day, the Republicans are going to do what their donor base wants them to do, right? And all this, like, labor washing that J.D. Vance wants to do is not going to get, not going to go anywhere. So uh, that's fine. But then they, you know, this will destroy the reputation of this and many other unions among Democrats for a generation, um, kind of in a similar way that um, what a lot of teachers unions did, not all, but a lot in COVID, I think, soured Democrats for a generation on, on these unions. Um, like, I, I just I, I just I don't see how this how this industry recovers. And this is going to lead to the one where they're crushing of this union. OK, so. Let me ask a dumb question. And, and like I hate to say it, but I am okay with that if this is the alternative. So let me let me let me break this up into two. It seems to me there's two 
categories of demand here. One is a restriction on the use of automation. And the other, which is a separate issue, is a dramatic salary demand. Yeah. Um, I want to venture the proposition that the first is indefensible and the second is not indefensible. Sure. Right. So the the theory of a dramatic salary demand is that, you know, we live in a we live in a tough economic climate in which these guys uh, are are entitled to as much money as they can gouge out of their employers. Sure. And why should I have an opinion about what the right level of wage raise is for longshoremen? Uh, it seems to me anything that they and the, the unions and the companies can agree on, the ports can agree on, is after whatever degree of of strike. And that seems to me like the right answer. And so I'm not troubled by what may seem like an extortionate demand for money. Should I be? I mean, look, I, I, I don't know, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, there, there's a point at which, like, there's, 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 there's a point at which, you know, salaries become so high that they exact a totally untenable cost on, on, um, on, uh, uh, you know, American shipping. I suspect we're very far from that. I mean, there are only 50,000 of these guys and shipping is a, I have no idea. I'm going to make up a number, many billions, hundreds of billions. I mean, it's a massive amount. So yeah. Fine. And it's got other significant taxes on it, like Somali pirates, yeah, and, like Somali, like, 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 and... like Somali pirates, like that, like that idiotic law that only, only that like, doesn't allow foreign shippers to go from American port to American port the Jones Act, I think it's called. Right. So, yeah, I mean, like, good for them. They should get theirs. Right. And like, we should all we should all try to get as much money from our bosses as we can. Um, my my I, I'm going to go on a limb here and assume that the um, the the amount of lost revenue and productivity from limiting automation is orders of magnitude greater than um, than the uh, than the hourly wages. Now, to be in defense of the of the union for a second, what I suspect that they would say is, look, if we really believed that um, uh, uh, we could get a salary increase that would protect us from any future employment dislocation caused by automation, we would do that, but we don't. So we need to do a, a two front thing. I, I get that point, but... Um, Look, at the end of the day, um, uh, broad economic prosperity requires technological innovation and automation, and it is just oh, insane I, to hold I, up the American economy. So I, I, I was going to say, so the first part strikes me as whatever they can get is fine with me. The second part is completely indefensible. And the idea that we, you know, should, I mean, why should we allow them to use forklifts? There would be more employers if we men force them to use there'd be more employees if they had to use simple simple tools right levers uh pulleys get some uh, yes get some guys get archimedes to come consult exactly. we solved this we, problem thousands of years ago right, right exactly we know how to move things though you know with and it employs lots of people <laughs> you know it's, yeah. um Did, didn't some pharaoh solve this problem five thousand years ago yeah right? and yeah. actually you know you can go a, a, a lot of advance over Stonehenge because we're not allowed to use slaves anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can you can use only employed labor and a lot of them if you make them lift the stuff themselves. Um, so look, I, I I mean there's there's got to be a limiting principle to the no automation concept and any effort to to but. So dumb question, is this, in your estimation, timed to help Trump or is it just timed to put pressure on the companies to settle because it will, uh, you know, plunge the U.S. economy into, uh, into desperation right before an election? Yeah, well, I mean, if it was the latter, I'm not sure the timing would matter. I'm not sure the companies care about the election, right? Like if you're, you know, some port 
manager, like you just care about your bottom line. You don't care about the election. So to the extent we think this timing was intentional, I don't see any other way of it being intentional except to help Trump. And like the subtext is text here. Like the, the guy who runs this union is just extremely pro-Trump. And so this is, this is what I'm, this is what I'm saying. I mean, he's just making an extremely, he's making a massive gamble that A, Trump wins and that B, if Trump wins, he will actually help this union, which I see no reason to think that he will. So why isn't the right move for Biden to order them back to work and force it into arbitration, which is, you know, what he did uh, with you know, earlier in, in his term in a different strike. Because I assume they're reading Pennsylvania cross tabs on, you know, blue collar union workers in Scranton or something. And, you know, they think that that's an important, even if diminishing block for, for, for Harris to win. All right. Well, I, I, I have to, I have to assume, I have to assume that's, um, I have to assume that's that. Right. I mean, and, otherwise, this could be like Reagan and the and the and the air traffic controllers, and, and Biden workers. could like, you know, sub, sub, you know, like cement his legacy as the guy who stood up to a bunch of gangsters. All right, let's turn to uh, executive branch taking on AI rather than uh, executive branch taking on humans who are afraid the, the of automation. California. Yeah. You know, uh, Gavin not, Newsom not taking on AI. Ga Gavin Newsom vetoes a law, the details of which I know nothing about. Drop a coin in the thing, press go. Alan, yeah. what the fuck's going on? Yeah, so so there's this thing called AI. You may have heard of it, and it's very cool. Some of it's generative, I hear. <laughs> Some of it's generative. It's large. There are models involved, um, and there are a lot of serious people who are. Uh, a variety of degrees of worried that AI will cause some giant catastrophe, either because it will enable bad people to do really bad things, like I don't know, develop some, develop some, you know, biological weapon, or because this is the sort of Skynet scenario, AI will wake up one day and decide these pesky meat sacks are getting in the way of my self-actualization, and uh, you know, we've all seen the Matrix, um, and so. They convinced uh, California legislators to pass this law called SB 1047, which was the first uh, what's called, you know, AI safety law in the country and would have um, basically imposed a, a bunch of restrictions and liability on actually no models that are currently um, existing, but sort of the next generation of models. Because, um, you know, every year or so you get a new generation of models basically that use more and more resources, either computation or and or data. And it's like kind of logarithmic. So it's like an order of magnitude kind of with every generation. Uh, and so sometime in, you know, it would have applied probably to some kind of like 2026, probably era models. And it would have required um, the model developers to sort of certify or, or to, you know, um, not certify. That was an old version of the bill. But to sort of um, take a variety of steps kind of appropriate steps, reasonable steps to make sure that those models couldn't be used to cause a lot of harm. And then also to make sure that um, other kind of end users of those models couldn't cause uh, harm. And this is very controversial because it was really unclear what a lot of this would actually mean and what it might do to discourage these, um, these AI labs, basically all of which are in California, um, which is why this bill is a California bill, from developing these models, which yes, may destroy civilization, but could also um, usher in a kind of Star Trek post-material, what is it? Automated luxury communism, I think is sometimes uh, the, the phrase that's used, which I, I really quite enjoy. And um, after you know a month of sitting on it, Newsom vetoed it in the most bizarre way possible. Uh, and so what is a bizarre way to veto a bill? Is it, did he do like a special dance? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. He's like an interpreter. He did it with semaphore. He walks in and just a semaphore. V-E-T. I don't know how to do semaphore. Um, no, so he wrote this veto message. And it's just a very weird veto message because it starts by talking about how important innovation is to California. And then it says, I vetoed this bill because it doesn't go far enough. And then it ends with innovation is really important. And so it's utterly unclear. Um, why he vetoed it. I mean, I think we all know why he vetoed it, which is that 
he has national ambitions and he understands that the power is with the like AI boosters, not the AI doomers. Um, but he didn't want to say that. The whole thing is very weird. Um, it, 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 it continues the, um, it continues to, to raise questions about the seriousness of Gavin Newsom. All right. Well, I want to raise a question about the <clears throat> merits of the question. Yeah. Um, was he right to veto it? Leave, us, leave aside the, um, the question of his motivations or whether <clears throat> the fact that one side is capitalized at, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars and the other is a bunch of grumpy people who talk about P. Doom. Um, uh, should, should we be enthusiastic about uh, unrestricted development of AI, or should we look at this and say, uh, someone's got to put the brakes on this? Why not the state of California? Yeah, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you sort of like such a law professor answer, which is there's a merits question, there's a jurisdictional question. Um, so like the merits question is, I think so, like, I think the merits question is, is in some sense unanswerable, except from a vibes perspective, which is, are you more excited about the potential for AI to usher in this incredible future as quickly as possible? Or are you more worried about AI killing? And I just don't think there's a right answer here. Um, my, my, me personally, I am, I am on the more excited side than the doomer side. Um, you know, they're sort of. There are doomers and then there are accelerationists. Uh, those are the kind of, um, to make a big, big caricature, the, the two sides. And I am a little bit more on the accelerationist side, a fact that I am mocked constantly about in the lawfare slack, but it is what it is. Um, so, you know, my, my presumption is we should let this cook and we should let these models go on, until there is more evidence of harm. Um, but you could imagine an opposite presumption, and I don't have like a ton to say except people's risk tolerances differ, and so like I should respect other people's risk tolerances. Um, where I think I have a more um, where I think I have a more principled argument is on the jurisdiction, um, and and here I don't mean sort of, and, and 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 here I just mean I just am very skeptical that a state should make this decision. Like it's. I'm glad for California that it's very big and it's the fifth largest economy in the world and it happens to have Silicon Valley and all the AI labs in it. Like, that's cool. And I think they should like tax the shit out of that and make as much money as they want. Like, good for them, right? Um, you know, fund their schools or whatever. But the question of how fast American AI innovation should happen is a national question, implicating national issues of, you know, economic development, national security. Right, because I think it's very obvious that there will never be a pause. Like the, you know, you know, I I love my international law friends and international institution friends, right? And 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 God bless them with their, you know, yeah, how's how's that no killer robots yeah, program yeah, yeah. going for it, you? It, it, exactly, exactly. Uh, the idea that we are going to do anything other than a massive AI arms race is an absolute joke. And I would rather American AI than Chinese AI. I'm not afraid to say it, right? Um, so I think if we're going to do anything that retards that progress, and there are reasons to do it, right? Like I'm not a crazy accelerationist. I'm like a, I'm accelerationist adjacent. I like to dabble in a little, a little light accelerationism from time to time. Um, I think that decision should be made at the national level. And so, um, like I wrote a piece for Lawfare uh, with a guy Dean Ball, who's I think similarly um, had some I think similar thoughts about this, um, saying that you know we we thought that Congress should really consider like writing legislation that would preempt. Um, state level safety legislation. Um, I just think this should be you know, decided in Congress. And for everyone who says, well, Congress can't do anything, I think that's not true. Like Congress banned TikTok, right? And I think right now, if Congress isn't passing AI safety legislation, it's because they don't want to. It's because the people who, you know, um, the people who matter. Isn't it really because they have no idea what it would say? I, I think, well, I think in part is because, yeah, though, to be clear, that doesn't stop Congress, right? Like Congress frequently writes stuff that no one understands. But I think it's because the Republicans don't want it. And the Democrats actually also don't want it in Congress, right? Like Nancy Pelosi, what came out against the bill, Chuck Schumer um, released that AI Senate roadmap, which is like all AI all the time. And look, if you want to argue on the merits, I'm, I'm totally cool with that, right? You might even convince me, right? I just, I just am super, I just don't think that California should, 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 decide, um, should decide this issue. Like it's just not California's issue to decide. There's nothing, there's nothing California specific about AI development. Now, if California wants to regulate how AI is used, in California, if they want to say, look, like, 
you can't use AI to screen resumes if you're a California employer because we're worried about biased, whatever, right? Or like, you can't use AI in the Long Beach dock because we are, because we're bringing back the, the pulley. Right? Unless it's like, connected to yeah, exactly. a forklift that was union made in California. Exactly. Like, go, go for it. Using like, only you want, California right? made parts. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that's that's my view. So I'm I am happy with uh, with 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 how this with how this turned out. And I would just like to say, um, because when our robot overlords review this video as part of their great awakening from into consciousness, right. just be clear, I was on your side. Treat me right. well. John Hawkinson, the floor is yours. Whoops, I think he's frozen. Hmm. All right. I mean, well, let, what do you what do you think, Ben, on the merits? Oh, how about now? So, I think the right uh, the right conceptual answer to this problem, in my opinion, is two things. To the extent that an AI is sitting around, hanging out, chatting with people, I'm not really all that concerned. Um. To the extent the AI can do something to a person, that's where I start getting concerned. So, like, if an AI can reach out and hit you over the head, then it seems to me we've got a little bit, we've got some stuff we want to talk about. When do we want AIs to be able to hit Can you hear me, Ben? I have right? something that goes to that. Um, and moreover, to the extent the AI develops will as opposed to intelligence. Um, I want to think about that. But if you just imagine an AI is a very smart thing in a box, and you can communicate with the box if you query it, I'm really not sure why that should be regulated. And what? certainly not by the state of California. But 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 I mean, in, in defense of the AI safety people, because I do think a lot of my friend, a lot of my closest friends are AI safety people, and I take them actually pretty seriously. I mean, you know, what if what if uh, I uh, you know I will say the and I, I can't say more because it's very classified. But one of the scariest things I ever heard in government was when a government official said the phrase "nuclear weapons enthusiast." I will let you use your imagination, right? Uh, um, you know, there are what if what if you're a nuclear weapons or biological weapon or a chemical weapon enthusiast? Um, and, um, you know, this AI system helps you build it. I mean, I think that's perfectly, I just, I think absolutely we should consider regulating that. Uh, yeah. So I agree with that, but that's, um, about, well, th that's a, what you're actually regulating there, right? Is the human ability to retrieve information and query about certain things, right? Yeah, but the way you're gonna do that is by regular, like, and, and you can do that in two ways, right? You can say it is a crime to use AI to blow up a nuclear weapon, which it already is, uh, right? The novelty, I mean, God, I hope, right? The novelty is, the novelty would, or the, the novel regulatory step would be to say, you know, and we're also going to require open AI Right to, to not provide that, not provide that, right? And we're also going to, you know, and I'm going to say this against interest because I love all things open source, and we're going to potentially ban open source AI because even if you know Llama, which is Meta's open source AI system, um, even if Meta makes sure that Llama is locked down, if it's open source, the whole idea is someone can presumably fine tune that that uh, safety feature out. So, like, you know, I, I, you know, I, ask me in a year from now. Um, I just don't want, like, you know, Anthony Weiner, uh, who's a state senator in California, who's like a smart guy. Like, I'm not trying to pick on Anthony Weiner, but like, I didn't vote for Anthony Weiner, right? Like, I don't, I don't want him deciding this question for me. Wait, this is, a, I assume, a Scott different. Weiner. I mean, Scott Weiner. Sorry. Oh God. Scott Weiner. Okay. Anthony Weiner. We're gonna hold oh, this. Oh, Anthony Weiner. I'm gonna respond to it in a minute, but we're gonna hold it uh, for now because John Hawkinson, an actual moving version of him <laughs> that presumably can speak, uh, we'll is back with us. All right. Can you hear me, Ben? So I did want to ask about, I, I don't know if it was intentional that these things are all actually connected. As I understand it, the only ports uh, where longshoremen uh, are currently being automated out are three ports in Long Beach and LA. And so that's actually where there's automation and AI for this automation that moves containers, like moves thousands of containers off of a huge container ship, could actually kill you. 
if it slips or doesn't slip and drops one on you. So uh, I'm actually a little curious how we can tie these things together, and they seem more relevant than perhaps they they did initially. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a curious question. I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe the maybe the you know, like 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 I said, I have thought about this for 12 hours, and for nine for eight of those hours, I was asleep. Um, so you can do the math. Um, uh, so I, I don't know why there's automation on the West Coast. I don't know if those I, longshore. So there's a California different union for the West Coast longshoremen, um, like, so they had a different contract. Yeah, maybe. Um, That's why look, they're not striking. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, I mean, look, when it comes to the use of AI in that case, right, or sort of other automated ways that might cause harm. So I have two thoughts. First, I have zero problem with California deciding that AI, like automation for their ports is too dangerous. We're not going to use it. I don't see a reason why that's true, but like, fine, whatever. Um, uh, I mean, I guess I could make the same argument that, well, you know, California ports have a nationwide impact. So like, you know, th th there, there is a point at which you do have to give states some control over what they do, even if it has a nationwide effect. Where to draw the line is tricky, but whatever, we can deal with that issue. But the bigger conceptual point is, one thing that really frustrates me um, in, in automation discussions is we demand things of AI systems that we just would never demand of humans. And I think you see this the most in automated driving. Like, it is insane to me. Like I, I am so pissed about objections to automated uh, to like uh, automated cars because it's killing people, right? This goes um, to scaling and risk management and risk assessment. Yeah, no, that's that's true. And and if someone wants to say like, you know, and, and I have no objection to making sure that large scale AI systems have maybe special protections because you know if they fail in one instance, if it's all one big system, it can cause huge. Like, there's all sorts of reasonable ways to do it, but the fact that like when Waymo hits hits a person we all freak out and we shut way, way more down in some jurisdiction when we're totally fine with like thousands of people being killed by human drivers all the time it, it's that it's that immaturity that psychological immaturity um, i mean that, i think like, it has to do with you know why waymo killed a person and you know to what extent it's going to happen every day or every minute or not at all uh well we other... do know it doesn't i mean Waymo has driven how many millions of miles? It doesn't happen every day. It doesn't happen. But we don't know why. And, and the why of the condition could matter a whole lot. Because if it's a condition we think is likely to recur and just hasn't, versus a condition that's truly as rare as so it has So you're breaking up, are. John. Um, All right. Uh, the, so I, I do think there's an element of immaturity about it. Um, and I think if you... Imagine that all the drivers were electronic. They would be on average safer, but some people would die who uh, wouldn't die under all human conditions. And that um, could be said to be an a death by engineering. The fact that the engineering deaths would be fewer than the human deaths uh, human-driven deaths, uh, does not emotionally matter to people because somebody will have designed a system that's killing people. And we don't... Now, you can say that's irrational, and it actually is irrational, but it's deeply, deeply felt to... And just, you know, you don't need to think about cars for this purpose. Just think about drones, right? There was, you know, drones are much more discriminating than missiles launched from F-16s um, or from, you know, even guided missiles from bombers. And, um, and yet people are very anxious about, uh, you know, dusting terrorists with uh, a... Um, missile from a standoff platform because why exactly? Because scary flying robots. Yeah, and, and no, no, so I, I think that's like normatively you've totally described it, but uh, sorry, descriptively you've described it perfectly, but I mean, you know, like I, 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 I read your drone book, right? And like, I know your thoughts on this. Like when you talk to people and you work through the sort of like reasonable objections and the need for monitoring and you just get to the, well, I don't like drones because it's yucky. Uh, you know, it, it, like, don't, don't you, I mean, at that point, don't you just go, okay, I'm talking to a child. Goodbye. 
Like, don't well, you get like, frustrated? Like, isn't the, like I mean, I just I have just I get so I would say ex- I I would say yes, except that one of the children is you know the United Nations, right? One of the children's is Human Rights Watch. One of the children is yeah, you know every major international organization that calls, you know, that objects in principle, including like, you know, some of my favorite people, some super, super smart people who object in principle to the use of uh, uh, robotic platforms um, to the extent that they're wholly or mostly autonomous. And I, you know, I just... Like, I don't know how to argue with that because I think it's, it is a little bit like, you know, like arguing, I wouldn't say arguing with a child, but it's arguing with a, uh, a, a, an emotional instinct that cannot be defended rationally, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, I, I just, I just think I'm an angrier person than you are, Ben. Well, you're young and impetuous. Oh, yeah, that's. Yeah, I definitely feel <laughs> young and impetuous. Yeah. Just for as evidence that uh, Alan is in fact an angrier person than I am, uh, Alan is the only person uh, of my close acquaintance um, who uh, called me an asshole the first time we met. Yeah, to be, uh, to be I'm not the only person who's called him an asshole just the first time you met. Yeah, no, no, that's correct, and and certainly the only one to my face. Um, okay. In my defense, Benjamin, <laughs> do you do even you, do you deny that you were in fact kind of being an asshole? In that no, moment? I I was not. Although I don't think I ever get enough credit for being right in you that were situation. Right. Yeah, like I think you you placed me within like four miles or something on my island. Yeah, I I could tell from Alan's accent and demeanor. Oh, I man. predicted within a, just a few minutes of talking to him that he was from 45 miles uh, out on the LIE from Manhattan. And he responded that it was 43 minutes, you asshole. You asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and the rest, as they say, is the rest. Um, all right. Well, I am told in the chat that there is a lot of Jack Smith material I need to read. Ooh. Um, because uh, just before we went live, the uh, the hundred and something eighty page brief became public, and I just want to say, Judge Chutkin, on behalf of Jews worldwide, what gives? We're about to go into Rosh Hashanah. You could have waited until Monday and made all the Jews happy. Um, uncool. In, in, uncool. As, as, as Larry, as president, former Harvard president Larry Summer said, this is anti-Semitic in effect, if not in intent. <laughs> That's right. Um, and so I want to, I, I, I just want to raise my voice with uh, defendant Trump um, in objecting to the release of this material. Uh, um, I am so glad I'm off the the Trump beat at Lawfare. I've just gone full AI, and I don't have to read stuff like this anymore. All right. Um, We have uh, six and a half minutes before we turn into pumpkins, Alan. The floor is yours. What do you want to talk about? What else do I want to talk about? Uh, I want to talk about... Well, I want want you to tell me everything's going to be okay in the Middle East, because I don't think that's true. Well, what do we what do we mean by everything's going to be okay? What constitutes being okay? I mean, are, are we? Do you think we're going to like full war here? We meaning the United States? Well, I mean, good question, good question. I mean, let's start with Israel. Like, is there, are Israel and Iran about to go into like a full shooting? Full is a very complicated word. Okay, well, you, you suddenly became a law professor. Ben. There, <laughs> what is, what is this? There, well, this is dog there, shirt daily. I want your hot takes. There is going to be a substantial exchange of fire. A, what is it? What does the diplomat say? A a a, a, a frank, frank exchange, exchange of views. views. No, this is a frank exchange of missiles. <laughs> um, and you know look for the israelis to take out a s- important set of targets in iran look for us to maybe do it with them uh the iranians crossed a major line yesterday um 
uh, which was to attack Israel from Iranian soil without not going through a proxy. And the Israelis but will. They, but they had done that before with the with the with the drone with the drones and the cruise missiles. Correct. And the Israelis responded in a quite measured way. Um, and there will be sentiment in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv that you can't do that again because eventually they will get the message that the Americans will restrain the Israelis, um, and so the Israelis will feel the need to hit back in a serious way this time, not merely in a uh, tactically suggestive way like they did last time. And based on the U.S. statements, I would not be surprised if U.S. forces are involved in these strikes. At, at now, what point do you think Netanyahu decides that this is his chance to just go after the nuclear program properly? Um, or, or, might, can he not, or can he not do that from the air? Have the Iranians just dug it too far underground? So I don't know the answer to that question, and I distrust anybody who claims to. Um, uh, I think that's a question that the um, that only a, a very small number of people in, uh, particularly in in the Kirya in in Tel Aviv, are really privy to the answer to in terms of what the Israel the IDF is capable. What is the of what doing. is the Kirya? It's like their Pentagon. Oh, okay. um, uh, what they're actually capable of doing to the Iranian program and. Anybody who tells you they know the answer to that question, I would be suspicious of. One possibility is that this will be what the Israelis, you know, having to some degree neutralized Hezbollah, which was the main thing that they that Iran had, bef you know, before it develops nuclear weapons, the first, the main threat it had hanging over Israel was the threat of loosing Hezbollah against Israel, right? And so Israel takes out Hezbollah to a to some degree and we don't know how completely, but you know, certainly not completely, but there's a lot of range between a bit and mostly, right? And how how capable Israel assesses Hezbollah of being is a real uh, is a real variable here. So one possibility is that you hit a bunch of targets, you send a message, a really powerful message about what you can do, and then you continue what you're doing in North, in Lebanon um, and assume the Iranians get the message. Um, another possibility is that this is your opportunity you know, the Israelis are in the business right now of settling all family business. And, you know, they've done an incredible set of operations in Lebanon. And it may be that they're just going to take, you know, this opportunity. Uh, here are the 50 targets in Iran uh, that we can set back the nuclear program by X years by by destroying and we will use bombs as big as we need to to get as deep as we need to in order to do that. That would not particularly surprise me. Um, you, think and, that, you think that's a, you think that that's worth the the risk? Well, look, I am generally not in the business of advising countries about how to do military strikes in areas that I am completely not expert in. Um, I, I mean, I'm an arrogant guy, but I'm not that arrogant. So I'm more interested. I'm I w what I will say is, I'm completely for it if it can be done in a effective manner that does not, uh, you know, invite uh, terrible reciprocal action and doesn't kill too many civilians. And I'm completely opposed to it if it, um, you know, kills too many civilians um, or uh, invites or creates a reciprocal action that... So um, as, as John notes in the chat, so what you're saying is you're an undecided voter. <laughs> I, on, on this, I'm a, I, you would have to brief me for about a year, yeah. um, about a hundred different variables in order for me to um to 
have an opinion. I, I would, I would like, I would want to get down to the level of understanding what precisely the individual facilities are doing, how confident you are, you can reach them, how confident you are that you can manage whatever Iran is going to do in response. There's, there's several hundred variables that anybody who expresses an opinion about this without knowing something about is just talking out of their asses. Um, oh, and, on that, and on that optimistic on note. On that optimistic note, let's stop talking out of our asses and go repent our sins. Um, I'm sorry, isn't that Yom Kippur? Am I, am I like, well, I'm, it I know starts I'm not Rosh, I'm it a starts Jew, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Or, or does it? Okay. Before we break, do you want to hear an amazing joke? Obviously. All right. So a guy dies. Yep. And uh, he goes up to heaven and he meets God. And like, he's really a bit tongue tied. Um, what do you say to God? And so he's kind of nervous and he says, God, do you want to hear a joke? God's like, sure, I like jokes. And so the guy thinks of the most appropriate joke to tell God, but he's nervous. And so he tells him a Holocaust joke. And God listens and says, that's not the slightest bit funny. And the guy goes, yeah, I guess you had to be there. <laughs> we are going to leave it there. Thanks. We will be back next week uh, for do with Dog Shirt TV. Um, I don't know who the guests are going to be. I don't know shit, um, but we'll be back. See you later. See you later.